which is fine if you're fighting a war, I guess, but it is certainly not a way to run a reactor for peaceful purposes. Certainly people were following that reactor all the time. Uh, it did not appear to be a hazard to the public or to our employees. And uh, in retrospect, it wasn't a hazard to our employees or public. And we put the plant back on the line. The training film emphasizes the speed with which the reactor was put back online, but the operation took more than a year. Special grappling tools were engineered and constructed so radioactive garbage could be removed remotely under the eyes of television cameras since the reactor was too hot to open. A nuclear physicist who saw this film compared this to conducting heart surgery through the patient's nose. Enormous equipment had again to be designed and then built to rotate the 75-ton steel and cement plug that capped the reactor. It had to be moved each time a damaged fuel rod was to be taken out. That in itself was a delicate operation with special seals and containers required to make sure radioactive gas didn't leak out. Then the gigantic plug had to be rotated to the next rod so it could be taken out too. Fourteen months and millions of dollars later, the fuel had been shipped for burial in Beatty, Nevada. The SRE was operating again. But all this without any public notification. How dangerous might it have been? It's not that much of a hazard to even our local people. Uh, as evidenced by the short period of time it took us to clean up the facility and recover it. Uh, the potential hazard of, of major release into the environment was just not there. It's obvious that uh, there was severe fuel damage suffered, either during the excursion or prior to it or just after it. Uh, some of it probably was aggravated by the uh, restarting of the reactor. Uh, but it would have been possible, of course, for a, uh, a, a much more serious damage to have been incurred and for more radiation to have been released. As you could hear, it sounds a lot like the debate over Three Mile Island. Although there was the potential for serious public exposure, the hazards never developed. On the other hand, the public never was told how great the risks were. Tomorrow we'll tell you more about what those risks really were and how they were handled. Kelly? Warren, where and how did you get your hands on that 20-year-old film of the accident and well, the documents as well? The, uh, the film and the documents are public records because the project was funded by the federal government. The problem is knowing where to look for them and it was not easy to find them. Uh, the material that we got mostly came from the government, a lot of it Bridge the Gap, which is called Bridge the Gap, which is called Bridge the Homes and Documents and other things. Most of the material we got came from there. We also got, however, some material from Atomics International. They were very helpful and gave us some documents and also some film as well. And we got some material from from an outfit in, uh, in Westwood called Bridge the Gap, which is an anti-nuclear group. They were able to give us some government documents, too. I think they also gave a couple of things to the Los Angeles Times. All right, thanks very much, Warren. We look forward to the series continuing tomorrow night. The SRE was cooled not with water, as most reactors now are, but with sodium, a liquid metal. This animation, on a government film never shown in public before, shows the sodium filling up the reactor, going up between the radioactive fuel rods. When the fuel rods partially melted in 1959, the sodium absorbed the most dangerous of the materials produced by the accident, so they stayed in the reactor. But the operators did not know what had happened till sometime after the accident occurred. The official reports almost sigh with relief. But it could have turned out differently. Luckily, the fission product release, that is the release of radioactive materials, was contained within the sodium. But there was always a chance that if fuel melting had proceeded unchecked, that it would have been released into the surrounding area, especially iodine and strontium. The iodine and strontium are very dangerous because the iodine goes to the thyroid glands of young children, causing thyroid cancer, and the uh, strontium goes to the bones of growing children, causing leukemia. So the worst stuff stayed in the sodium as it circulated through the reactor, transferring heat from the fuel rods to the steam, which generated electricity. But the sodium itself created another risk. It bursts into flame if it contacts water or air. A sodium explosion could have sent radioactive materials into the atmosphere. There were sodium accidents at the SRE, but none occurred during the partial fuel melting. Other less deadly gases, though, were released into the building above the reactor and ventilated into the outside air. What happened to them? Diffused over the decade and disappeared. You have to look back 
at the population density of the Santa Susana in, the, in that period. You were up there the other day, but at that time it was a dirt road to Santa Susana. Uh, there was no population in the area. If there had been somebody there, what harm could those gases have done? Your lung tissue is very sensitive to radiation. The inhalation dose is ten times the skin dose. And so noble gases uh, are very penetrating. They can go right through a gas mask. They can go through activated charcoal. They will bathe the lungs with beta radiation and gamma radiation and can cause cancer in the lung tissue. They, of course, they are also very rapidly dispersed because they are noble gases. They will not stay in the body like iodine and strontium. It's not clear how much of the less deadly gases actually were released. What evidence there is does not show contamination outside the reactor itself. And despite what might have happened, a 25-year veteran employee says he's not worried. I feel less concerned about it than I would do the long-term effect of the smog of Los Angeles. Or, and certainly what I get is uh, less than what I might get with medical x-rays if I had a GI series. Uh, um, I'm not getting, you know, nothing foreign is good for the body, but I, I feel that I'm taking a much less risk getting that small amount of radiation than I could with many, many other things in modern life. The reactor was shut down for good in 1964. Experimentation had been concluded and new safety requirements would have required expensive upgrading. For 10 years, it sat in what's called protective storage. Then, in 1974, it was decided to tear it down. Decommissioning turned out to be an enormous operation, more expensive than the original cost of construction. A special torch operated at 80,000 degrees Fahrenheit underwater to shield the workers from radioactivity while they cut up the steel and concrete container that held the reactor. Even underwater, the torch could cut through six inches of steel at three or four feet a minute. Complex stainless steel plumbing posed special problems, pipes within pipes and elbows within elbows. Explosive cutting techniques used in oil fields were adapted to that task again with special precautions because of the radioactive contamination. Some pieces, like this 61-ton ring shield, were apparently too big to cut down, and they were packaged in plastic and shipped intact for burial in Nevada. Other equipment, like these radioactive waste tanks, were underground, and they had to be dug up before they were taken away. Some parts of the reactor building and some of the dirt around it were contaminated enough, so they had to be taken away as well. Though again, Atomics International insists there was never a public danger. Today, five years after it started, the process is still going on, although the reactor building is only a shell. Atomics International likes to say the decommissioning is providing experience that will help in taking other reactors apart, especially the breeder reactors, which also will utilize sodium cooling if that program ever gets off the ground. But the sodium reactor experiment, or SRE, it's been reduced to a hole in the ground. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is worried about sabotage. It has held up the shipping of spent fuel from the San Onofre reactor, saying it should not be moved through centers of population. At the same time, the Department of Energy allows large quantities of spent fuel to be shipped right up the freeway to Santa Susana, where the SRE used to be. These shipments are part of a project that started years ago, half a continent away. This is a son of the SRE at Hallam, Nebraska. Newer and bigger, it was based on the SRE, but lasted only a couple of years before it was abandoned for reasons much like those that finished the SRE. The spent fuel from Hallam was shipped from Nebraska to the nuclear dump at Savannah River, South Carolina, where it sat for about 10 years. Then, starting two and a half years ago, it was shipped to Santa Susana to begin reprocessing. Atomics International boasts the nation's largest hot cell, where radioactive material can be remotely handled by operators separated from it by 42-inch thick glass. Here, for two and a half years, the Hallam reactor fuel was prepared for reprocessing. The job was completed just one month ago. To get here, the fuel had to be trucked up the same steep, winding road this liquid oxygen truck is climbing, right past a couple of large mobile home parks, where business is brisk and the lots are filling up fast. 